Namaste and in lock catch and welcome to this episode of One World in a New World. I'm your host Zen Benefiel and just as a refresher course, Namaste comes from this Sanskrit spoken it's Brahmi and it means the divine in me recognizes the divine in you and from the other side of the world in La Ketch comes from the Mayan it means I am another you. So imagine with that kind of perspective of how we greet each other in all ways at all times, we can reflect on that and find more harmony in our relationships, in our community, in our nuclear families, and even in the world. So just consider that. Try it. See what happens. Don't believe me. Put it to the test. All right, so this week's guest is Diane Wiska, and she is just an amazing lawyer for <laughs> to begin with she's got an uncommon sense of, of continuity about what's happening in life and, and how she can be involved in that she's a consultant to professional women who really want to tell their stories and convey their messages she is a founder of engaged storyism trademark uh, method and she's also the principal of quarter moon story arts she's a corporate trainer uh, she's a litigation consultant, obviously being a lawyer, and she has just had this amazing life. So we're going to talk about that. And Diane, thanks so much for being here. Well, I, I'm delighted that you invited me into your cosmos, Zen, and that is a wonderful, wonderful introduction. I'm sure there's um, some uh, firstborns out there who recognize that, and namaste to you as well. Oh, thank you. Uh, so I, I, I'm really excited about where we're going to go, you know, with your understanding. And, and, you know, we talk about awareness and inner knowing and, and inner awareness and how that develops throughout our life. And, and oftentimes we don't pay attention to that, but there's some who garner that understanding young. And I have kind of an inkling that you may be one of those. So I'm going to inquire how that came about. What were the initial things that, that you thought, felt, saw, observed that brought you into, hey, there's something else going on here? You know, uh, in, in the course of listening to your question, I flashed back onto something that I haven't thought about in decades, in decades. I can still see myself, I'm young, um, maybe seven, and I'm going to a birthday party. And I was raised back east in New Jersey. And a lot of the houses, you know, have a little concrete stoop. And then there's a, a storm door in the summertime is a screen door. And then inside is the main door of the house. And taped on the main door of the house inside what would have been the storm door at that time. So you would have seen through glass was a piece of cardboard that had been colored over in black crayon, colored, 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 colored in mm -hmm. black crayon. And there was a note that said, um, tell us what number is underneath this black crayon. And I'm looking around going, well, that's kind of dumb. It's a four. It just, it was a four. I mean, you could just see it there, it was a right. four. Right, and right. In fact, that's, that's exactly what it was. But you try to tell people that and they think that either it was a lucky guess or that you're trying to get attention. And as the oldest of seven, that was often an issue. You know, you need to be seen and heard and you're finding ways to do that. And so that was it. It was a, it was a way to be noticed. OK, well, no. And so uh, like some of the experiences that you were sharing with me prior to this conversation, it becomes very difficult to stand your own ground and say, but no, I really saw it. And I remember one other thing. I was walking down the steps I um, in the house I used to live in. It was a two-story house and it was a wooden staircase. So a wooden staircase down to a landing and then turn 90 degrees and then all the way down to the bottom again. And I had, there was a hand railing um, on the left-hand side as I would be going down, but I wasn't using that. I had my briefcase in my hand and I was walking down those stairs in a set of black high heels, three inch heels. I was on my way to work in a law firm. And as I was stepped off onto the first step to go down, the 
heel of my shoe caught the edge of that first step. And I would have been headed down headfirst. And what happened next is still so, rem I, I so remember this. Something took the back of my collar of my jacket and pulled me upright. And my briefcase slid down to the landing. And there I was standing at the top of the stairs. But I wondered what the heck just happened. WTF is going on. And so, Good. yes, I could, I could spend the day and I won't telling you about episodes like that. But, but for your question, I don't think I would have remembered those two things those two moments, which are as real to me now as I can see you in our screen. Awesome. Isn't it really interesting how you don't think about things until a question comes up that you would have never considered, but all of a sudden, just like you saw those, that image, right, where others didn't, there was this sense of you knew what was, that there's this inner sight, if you want to call that, that can see through everything and, and that just knows. And I think we all have that. We talked earlier about, you know, that we're just cosmic consciousness condensed into form as a point of light that bounces back and forth between here and the great light for however many times it takes till we get it, right? Yes. <laughs> till we learn how to get along. <laughs> and then, but this has, and this has that sense of awareness that there is nothing hidden. And when we ask the right questions, answers come. You know, even who is it? Um, and I find this fascinating. Uh, Renee Maria Rilke. And uh, uh, he'd mentioned that, you know, when you ask the question, don't expect the answer right away because you're going to try and answer it with what you think you know. You have to experience the answer. So you let your life kind of play out and that at some point you trust, you know, that the answer will be there. And life will offer that answer eventually when you least expect it often, right? Because it's when you're not thinking about something that it shows up because <laughs> yeah. you're not looking for it, which oftentimes tends to push things away when you really have the, you know, you're pushing to try to find something that's, and it keeps being elusive. Well, you ask the question, let go. That's the process now where it didn't used to be. It was that destructive testing, right? You got to rip things apart in order to understand them. I've heard this so often about uh, finding the right partner, for example. You know, mm. just when you least expect it, that person will show up in the produce section asking you a question and, you know, uh, and off you go. Yeah, or, yeah. Yeah. or parents trying to get pregnant. Try, try, try hard. We're going to get this, you know, on routine. And then you finally let it go. It's happened in my family. You let it go and... There's conception. Right. I, I think there's a great deal to be gained from that notion that you ask and then you wait. And, and I've often heard it said, you know, be careful what you ask for, you just might get it, as if that's negative. And only recently have I come to an understanding that it's not, meaning it will come to you, but not in the way you expect, not in the way you anticipated, maybe not even the way that you asked for, prayed for, but something sure. will come and our job is to then say, thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay. Now with the, this inner awareness that you had that, that began young, in, in your early life, what were the kinds of things that you had to navigate through with others, with family, with relationships and things like that, that made it kind of challenging and yet also kind of gave you the opportunity to grow a bit more in, in how to manage it? Um, I'm going to bring it closer to present day Okay. to answer that. We can do that. Um, because I think that the, okay, so the experience that I'm going to give you is, a, is almost a culmination of that. Okay. So as children, we are often um, compressed or oppressed or told to stop telling stories. It's a story, stop telling stories. It's a lie stop telling lies. And the effect 
of that is to then shut down your true authentic voice. Mm. Okay, well, I'm going to give the words that you want me to give, as, as you said in our conversation earlier. I'll, I'll say what you want me to say. And over the course of time, the more you do that, the more hardened, calcified becomes and codependent. That. Yes. So that it, it is not an easy thing to reverse it. So when I was doing my litigation consulting work, oftentimes I would hear lawyers say, she has a tendency, meaning me, she has a tendency to curl in on herself when they've asked me a question about a story or trying to, to figure out what the story about the client is going to be. There is a sense, kind of like collapsing a football maybe. Mm -hmm. And what I was doing was seeing, I was seeing the answer. And that is the way that in which I was doing it, the voice was coming back again. And it was something that I could not explain. It was a way of hearing. It was a way of seeing. It was a way of being part of the story that asked to be told. Um, another example, um, years ago, I used to tell stories in a domestic abuse shelter. It was part of a way that um, we could encourage the women just to relax on a Wednesday night. Mm -hmm. And invariably, I would walk into that space and I would feel the stories that needed to be told. I had gone with my little preparation and my list of those things that I thought would be of use, of comfort, of benefit to them. And it always happened that there was a story that almost tapped me on the shoulder and said, pick me, I need to be told, I need to be heard. And when I listened to that voice and I and I acted on that voice. A woman would say, how did you know to tell me that story at this time? And like other people too, uh, growing up, I neglected, I neglected the voice. The voice had said, go here. No, I, I don't want to. Right. Learn this way. No, I don't want to. Don't marry this person. Yeah, I think I'm gonna. So these ways of seeing of being part of the cosmic consciousness are critical in terms of knowing when to follow and what will happen when we don't, when we go our own way and learn so that you can then turn around and say, oh, I, I see. I see what I should have seen. Right. Now. You get a cosmic tickle instead of a cosmic two before. There you go. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> I've learned. And, and we all get those, right? It, and yeah. it's, it's funny that, you know, you and I both have a similar um, instance in that of from younger, it was tough to keep our mouths closed. And yet we end up doing so and just had that inner life available that nobody else necessarily was aware of because we didn't know how to share it appropriately so that it could be received and heard from where we were speaking rather than this discrediting kind of nature that we tend to have yeah. towards others who express things that seem to come from an unknown place or source that's not identifiable. You, yeah, know, you mentioned exactly. earlier about how we categorize everything and, and how do you find that, like, for instance, the, the reflection you gave on that, you know, the, the turning in and how others saw you they were looking at you from a completely different place than you were in and kind of projecting their own idea because it looked like you were, you know, kind of getting smaller and going rather than seeing, okay, this is a process that she goes through. Let's just see what, what happens and where it goes and, and not place my perception on it because I don't know her. I'm just basing my perception on what I think might be true. That doesn't necessarily make it so. <laughs> no. right? it was, yeah, it was a hard thing to explain, to be able to say, I see this, I get this. Oh, I know where you're going with this. It, it was something more than 
intuition. It, it was something more than having a very good grasp of the case, for example. Mm -hmm. It was something more than that that said, okay, this is how you're going to tie these things together and get there in lightning speed. Sure. And sometimes and I, you don't know what you're going to say until it comes out of your mouth. Right. Or you and don't know then, what you're thinking until it comes out of your mouth. Until you're right? saying it. <laughs> I, can, I can still hear my mom because I would ask her a question. Then I go, oh, I got it. And I can hear her. Like, well, if you got it, what are you asking me for? Oh, okay, I got it. Because you I had to it. ask a question out loud. <laughs> you know, yeah. so in yeah. your, uh, and I'm sure you've been around uh, counselors and therapists, especially working with the population that you have, do you find that, in the discussions that it's not necessarily the questions you're asked by the therapist, it's hearing yourself talk about it that allows you to process it at another level and garner insights from there. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so often that is what my work is all about. I call myself a story doula because <laughs> like a midwife, like a doula, you know, sure. who, who invites the child out, who, who helps birth the child out. So much of my work, no matter whether it was in, in nursing, litigation consulting, um, communication consulting, story work, guiding, it's all the same principle. I believe, and I was very, very lucky to have been taught early on when I was coming up the story years, that we know the story we want to tell. We just need somebody to listen it out of us. And so story doula comes naturally. And I find that by doing that listening, that deep listening with appreciation, when you sit on your tongue and you let the other person tell their story and you, you might guide them with, with intentionally uh, chosen questions, mm -hmm. but they know where they want to go. They know the story that they need to tell, whether it's about their business, their vision, their client, their whatever. They know that. It, they have that inner knowing. Right. And what they're looking for is someone who will position themselves as a story doula. Yeah, absolutely. It. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. As a, uh, a transformational life coach, you know, the, the training and coaching is it's not about your story. Right, that, that's kind of the overarching thing. And I'm like, well, wait a minute, that's all we are, right? It's an assimilation of, of what we've experienced and the stories we tell about it. But what, and what you're saying, and I agree with, is that we invite that story and the rollout of it by listening intently, using active listening, reflecting on what we think we're hearing, and then being able to ask those profound questions that just kind of bubble up that are natural to draw the next part of the story from the other person that helps them craft their life in a different way because now they're being asked to to go a little deeper and to reveal themselves right and you do it in a psychologically safe and intellectually hum uh, humble place where there's no judgment there's no criticism there's only invitation to participate and then grow that story, the person also just, and I'm sure you've seen it, they just blossom, right? It's like they, they now have permission to just be and to emote and to share from a place that's so deep within them that nobody's ever asked them to go to yet. Yeah. yeah. Where did that come from? Well, <laughs> right. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been there. And now the story is asking to be told. I mean, I really do believe that story is not a soft skill. It is not a for children only type thing. I do believe that like wine, story is alive. It's organic. It can follow you home. It can sit at your table. It can sleep in your bed. It is very much alive. Well, you mentioned and the... The earlier uh, civilizations, the the ones that you know, the the, uh, the Aborigines, the, the Aborigines, great, the indigenous, that 
the oral traditions, those are all about storytelling and sharing because you have a context from which to develop the understanding, the wisdom from. And of course, <laughs> I had this um, mixed blood Cherokee friend of mine that says, you know, uh, he calls me up at, at 46. I'd been searching for him. He'd written a children's book. I'd interviewed him on uh, my earlier One World and lost track of him, didn't know where he was reached out to his web developer. And then a week and a half later, I get a phone call. Oh, see, oh, brother. And uh, so he says, one of the things he says, you know, it's something I need to share with you is that in our tradition, you cannot join or form your own council until you're 51. And that kind of set me back, like, because here I was at 46. But, hmm, interesting. And I could see the wisdom in that because not only have you gained life experience, you usually a grandfather by then as well. And so there's this, these layers of understanding and wisdom that you develop when you make yourself available, Yes. right? And inquire. And so how does that reflect in what you're noticing in the emergence of this new living awareness that seems to be uh, coming up in humanity now with all this stuff that's happening. Um, I will say that while we are in a place of deep turmoil. We have been in a place of deep turmoil before, whether this is the same turmoil or different turmoil, it's turmoil. Mm -hmm. Turmoil is turmoil. Hatred is hatred. Greed is greed. Okay, here we are. What is helping us along the road right now? is a sensitivity to two things. One is relationship and the other is engagement. And those two ways of being, if you will, are what recognizes the common denominator of our humanity. There are efforts being made to relate, to engage human to human instead of party to party, red to blue, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And that, that the, the image that I see around that is like, and you've seen it before, you know, a, a blade of grass that's growing up in a crack in a sidewalk. How is it possible? And yet it is. Mm -hmm. It is happening. And I believe it is that notion, that awareness that we are not superior, we are not inferior, we are not even equal. We, as Thich Nhat Hanh says, we inter are, we inter be. There is no way that we can take any one of us out of the other. You know, I look at something simple like um, the paper towel I was using right. earlier. And there is light and sun and rain and wood. It's all in there. And it's the same with us. We all enter our, you, you sit with somebody, although we haven't had that opportunity of late, but I remember an example sitting in a room uh, with people. We didn't have masks and we're breathing. And the speaker was saying just the exercise, just the breathing in and breathing out, we are absorbing the cells of other people. Mm -hmm. There is no place where we're not, where we can't be inter or we, we are so, we are so web woven. And perhaps it is this time that is saying there is no separation between us. And because there is no separation between us, 
then we have to act from that place mm -hmm. of interbeing. And that, I mean, that, that just might sound like woo -woo, kind of out there. No, it doesn't. It sounds very clear. And, you know, as you were talking about that, I had this phrase that came up some time ago that we're all seeking, we're all being buffeted on the ocean of emotion and in our relationships. And now we're, we're helping each other to seek safe harbor. Yes. And by doing so, even like you were saying, you know, the, the breathing, the sharing of cells, you know, we're 99% space according to what we understand with science now. And so that, that what's in between those squigglies <laughs> that are vibrating, right? Because it's not particles, they're little squigglies of energy. And that's consciousness. Well, that consciousness permeates everything. So yeah. why wouldn't it also have a natural order to it that when we acquiesce our relationship to that particular ocean that we find out that the drop is part of the whole yeah yeah there was something um that i'm still i'm still working on i'm doing some genealogy um for my family we were not a family of storytellers and a lot of my loved ones have gone to their graves with their stories and so it's really important to me. There's a sense of longing to belong to those stories, to who those people were. And it, it spills over into the engaged storyism work I do with other people. And the idea is that there was never a moment in time when we were not. And so mm. you start to think about it. So I came from a mother and a father. Okay, so I was there but they came from a mother and a father. Okay, I was still there. And they came from a mother and a father. I was still there. And so you go all the way back to the beginning of time and you might be you know, smaller than an angel dancing on the head of a pen, but you always were. Now, I also subscribe to the notion that we are stardust and that's how we you know, were shot out of whatever galaxy we came from and here well, we are. that's the physicality. I, I totally get that. And when yeah. you combine the two from the point of consciousness and the stardust being able to collect it around it and the planet's stardust. So, yeah. you know, we, we are, you know, our sun's a star. And, and so we're part of that creation. We may not understand exactly what that is yet. And yet we know it's there because we witness it. Yes. And so there is this emergence. Now with the, it, and it's funny, you were talking about the, the, the history of family, you know, I, I was kind of a unique beginning. I began as an orphan of birth, was given up for adoption, adopted, found out I was adopted. And then 61 years later, I met my birth mother. Oh my. And it was such an amazing experience um, with some stories, of course, but I'd always wondered, you know, is there anybody else as weird as me? And, and how can I find that out? It, it, do I have a history of this kind of sensitivity in the family? Or yeah. is it just something that, that I came from someplace else with as part of that? Because we all have cultural memories and histories and genetic memories and histories from our, our lineage and all that kind of stuff that we have to deal with that we may not necessarily know. Well, <laughs> so uh, here it is. And there was a uh, some behavior patterns and my wife noticed that I had similar to my mother and she just guffawed when it happened and I saw it too it, it, it was just crazy what was really interesting is that I found out that I'd met my birth father clear back in 1989 of at all places a UFO discussion group here in Phoenix he'd traveled oh out west and we met I spent a weekend with him at his cabin in Prescott he'd invited me up had no idea who it was and I don't think he did either he may have suspected more because he had a little more age to develop that awareness but he never said anything to me and I got to know him as a man I liked him and he was also weird like me so <laughs> right so that gave me that that uh, that uh, I guess greater level of confidence to be who I am, yes, and be okay with that because now I have some terrestrial anchoring. When at one point I kind of wondered, and I know that sounds kind of weird, but when you have the kinds of experiences I've had and be being told from others the the kinds of things I've been told in my life, it makes you wonder because you still have to leave that door open because you've got no absolute proof, right? So there's possibility. 
and especially with all the stories of the interactions that have been taking place with, for lack of a better, star families for yeah. a long time, we don't know. And and there's so, there's so many that have those experiences that they can't all be liars or, you know, storytellers, but they're storytellers in such a way that they're articulating as best they can these kinds of experiences that have no reference in this world, right? Because there's so much difference. Right. And so this kind of sets, as from what I've seen anyway, uh, sets those types in a different category where they aren't really being spoken to or listened to yet. And I have a feeling that's going to change. And that's part of the reasons why I went down the professional path that I did to garner the credibility so that I could speak more openly about these things and have the credibility to back it up. And I'm sure that's kind of, maybe I'm going to ask you, is that the kind, did, was that part of your impetus to going down the path that you did? And, um, you know, I don't necessarily adhere to Shakespeare and, and, <laughs> and his take on lawyers. However, <laughs> right, um, you have that, it seems, drive that that might, could have been part of that process in order to feel more confident in the world. Is that true or have you ever considered that? I don't think that I've considered it in the way in which you've posed it. Okay. But having heard that, then I would say, unbeknownst to me, there was something else a foot, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I knew, I knew that the world of language, the world of making your voice heard, the world of being a courageous speaker, willing to give life to your authentic voice, that is not something that I read in a book. That's certainly not something that came up in my family. I was raised, you know, out of a gener the generation I was raised in, the family I was raised in, the religion I was raised in, did not honor, you know, that idea. So it had to have come from somewhere. And so the best that I can say is that there was a knowing that guided the direction forward. And mm -hmm. when I got to uh, and so th story and that awareness has always been there. It, it was there when I was a, a nurse and knew things. It was there when I practiced law. When I got to litigation consulting, I knew that this way of being in the legal world to represent your client is what was critical for the health of the lawyer and the health and well-being of the client. Mm -hmm. And when I brought, you know, creative, right-brained R and J D storytelling to this field, they thought I was quite mad. I mean, they really did. I remember being in a in a group of of litigators, all of whom happened to be Scorpios, and I was an Aquarian. So you know that that's a bad combination, right? Oh my there. gosh, yeah. <laughs> but I remember overhearing a couple of them in the hallway saying. What the heck? Yeah, they thought I was quite mad. And at the same time, they knew I was right. right. And it was imperative upon them to do an archaeological dig on themselves, to look at their own stories, so that they could then turn around and doula the story out of their clients. And, 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 that required a beautiful melding of the left brain, logical, linear, if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. Mm -hmm. That side of the brain, the structured side of the brain, the part that looked at the facts of a case, the content of a case, and had to marry it with the sensitivity. The corpus callosum. There you go. That that there is so awesome. <laughs> so <close. laughs> oh, blah. <laughs> <laughs> but that right there showed that story, story calls on 
both sides of our brain, the logical side, the intuition side. And the best storytellers are attuned to that connection mm -hmm. within and around the story with the listener and with the teller. And some of the best lawyers, litigators that I ever worked with got that. They, they could really understand that if you're telling just the facts, you're missing the emotional story. And I don't mean drama and tears right, and right. blah, blah, blah. No, I mean- no, What you're talking about event. is a high EQ, right? This is, and this has just come out in the last, what, decade or so where the, yeah. there's been some real close attention being paid to uh, two things, innovative thinking and emotional intelligence. Intelligence, yeah. And the, the EQ being the emotional quotient that for, you know, whatever you're given for taking the test. Um, I was not surprised, but, but uh, in a way, I was right smack dab in the middle when I took the test. I thought, oh, cool. I, I've got some balance going on here. And so that makes the harmony the harm. more accessible yeah. because I can see both sides of things. I can feel my way through as well as think. And then be able to articulate something that has some sense, exactly. which is more than just offering words to think about. There's a exactly. deeper understanding, maybe even resonance. And I'm sure you've experienced that. Uh, or let me frame that in a question. How have you experienced that in the conversations and the, and the story development that you've had with your groups and with your clients and with yourself? How have I experienced what? Ah, the ability to make the sense, right? Because we, because ah. there, there's a sense that comes, it's not just making sense. There's a sense. It's more than thinking. It's more than feeling. It's a sense of resonance. Right. That one has when, the, so how, okay. So now that you understand that, the, the question was, how have you noticed that in yourself, your groups, and your clients? Right. You worked with now them? I've got you. Okay. okay. So this is, this is what happens. When, and, and, and I know that you've had this happen to you before. You've, you've sat in the presence of someone telling you a story and you've experienced this. And when I call this kind of story, it's, it's a heartfelt story. It's a heartfelt mm -hmm. story and it's artfully told. And what it does is it engages the listener on levels that they are probably not even aware of. And the reason that the story experience works this way is because the story resonates with the images, with the feelings, with the emotions, experiences sensations that live in that live in the listener and when the story raises those the story becomes personal mm -hmm. it becomes personal to the listener and at the same time the story is calling on universal truths truths with a capital t um right, wrong, uh, peace, justice, what, whatever you want to call it. Right. And because you have this now, this marriage, this fortification going on, the listener becomes a part of the story. And because now they have become a part of the story and the story has become a part of them, they can then recall the message that's in your story they can act on the message that's in your story. And they don't, they don't necessarily know. So here's, here's an example. When um, I told stories as a, as a professional storyteller or even, even now, you would, uh, I would tell a story. And when I was very young as a storyteller, I thought people were bored because I would look out and faces were kind of blank. Mm. Shit, I'm, you know, I'm failing here. I'm failing here. But what I imposter learned, syndrome showed up. Right. Huh? It's not working. <laughs> Better pack up and go home. Right. What I learned was that I would hit a point in a story 
that would bring up a sensation, a feeling, an image, an experience with the listener. And they would not literally, but figuratively rock out. Yeah, they'd the leave the room. They'd go back. They'd have that momentary out-of-body experience exactly. in, in the embracement or embracing of that relative information specific to them. That feeling, exactly. Yeah. They would they would momentarily leave the telling of the story and go into experiencing what that word or thought or image brought up for them. And then they would come back in to the story again. That's where those faces of right. concentration were showing me. Now you and bring up a diff a, an interesting point too, in, in that from the presenter's standpoint, you're observing this with uh, vulnerability, right? And, and you're seeing what appears to be disconnection. And so you're making some assumptions and I'm using the general you. Oh, yeah. and, and you may have done it also as you've stated. You're perceiving things differently than it actually is because you're really sensitive to wanting to be present with them and not realizing that you still are you're yeah. just reading them wrong exactly. and you're you're presuming uh, it's like you know the the bad news travels you know you hear nine times bad news nine times before you hear one good thing yes. and so we have this proclivity of negative assumptions that as the imposter syndrome uh, rolls out, we can recognize those things. And what you, what I hear you saying is that over time you saw that, you recognized it, and you also took it deeper to really get beyond your projections and really understand what was actually happening instead. Yeah. Yeah, and I didn't come to that by myself. I had some really good mentors. Well, I'm sure we teaching. always have others, you know, mentors that say, hey, what about Right. <laughs> but, but that then helped me understand how come story is so powerful because it's not a collection merely of words, but there is a whole organic process going on. It's a sharing rather than a project, rather than a push or pull. Exactly. There are three things that make up a story. There is the story itself, there is the storyteller, and there's a story listener. And those three elements are interlinked like the, um, the Olympic, the Olympic symbols. Mm -hmm. And when you have those three things going on, then the story is allowed to happen. And one of the, so I, I love telling, because I believe that on my mother's side of the family, we are Polish Jews, but I haven't quite gotten to that information yet. It's going to be interesting I love about the, the Wiska name and, and what the etymology of that is. Um, as far as I know so far, it's Polish. It means little piece of wood. So smaller than a matchstick, but bigger than a splinter. And according to my father, it means that um, we are royalty because it ends in an A. And hmm. instead of an SKI or an SKY, like our peasant cousins, right. I haven't figured that part out of it out yet, but that's a story. That is the story yeah, that yeah, we yeah. told growing up. But in any event, um, I love telling stories about the Rabbi Israel Ben Eliezer. And one of the, one of the stories that he would tell is that when you hear a story, whether you are sitting with another person or in, in a great company or even by yourself, you are to raise your eyes to your God and ask, why are you sending this story to me at this time? And so I tell you that because I come from a place where I cherish the organic, living, breathing quality of a story. I absolutely believe that when a story wants to be heard, it will find a way. And maybe, as we were talking earlier, maybe this COVID time is that time for the story of humanity, of cosmic consciousness, of a better way of being. That story 
needs to be told and it's being told and now will be heard in a way that has never been heard before because it's never been told like this before. I don't know. I don't in know. Our, I in our history, we've never had the opportunity to tell a story like this. Not globally. Collectively as a global village. Exactly. You know, it, it's happened in, in regions and, and nations from time to time, but and never, it, at least in the current civilization, have we had this opportunity to reach out to each other through the internet. I mean, the virtual world has just made so many, you know, it's like all the pieces were lined up just so we could play this game. And there was a, there was yeah, a question you asked about uh, being in the right place at the right time. And I have to say that I didn't intend to be here doing this work now, but I am. And the notion of engaged storyism is one that came along with, with this role, I guess, of being able to use story as a real practice, as a real system. Like we've got environmentalism and professionalism and humanitarianism and cubism. And so, okay, so let's take an ism and attach it to story and make that a practice as well. Mm. And with that, let's call it engaged so that we can use story to bring about a shift in our attitudes, in our behaviors, in our cultures. And that's gonna work, maybe not in my lifetime, but it's gonna work because the sorcery of the story is well, this that- <laughs> I love that term, the sorcery of the story. Yeah. And, and we've often seen sorcery as something, you know, no. Um, there's this wonderful way to craft things by using language, and you've taken full advantage of that. We ought to do that more. We're stuck with this, okay, here's the words that we have. Well, when we know the structure of words and language, then we can put different prefixes, suffixes, and, and you know, combine words and, and just have fun with language. Yeah. <laughs> right? And, and it, it gets that laughter, just like you just did, right? So, and when you have that, your energy changes, sometimes immensely, when you're able to tap into that laughter place, because that's in the freedom, right? Um, oh gosh, there was a couple of things I want to say. So the in this evolution of the process and, and the virtual space, the virtual world, the coming together of different people, uh, the different organizations that are forming uh, virtually and things like that, what you're saying in the engaged way, it, it's observable, right? You see it happening. Now we're in this place of ambiguity still because we don't know what the future holds all we know is that we need to do something and, and we need to figure out how to work together better in order to make it happen because what it is right now doesn't work for anybody except those that are at the top of the silos or the pyramids that are that have been competing with each other for the attention and, and the profit over people and planet as opposed to the people and planet over profit doesn't necessarily do away with profit Right, because we there is this economic system we're still involved with until we figure out something better. Yes. However, it isn't necessarily that so many different things are going to change. The systems are in place. They're all great. They may be mismanaged. And so that's the next phase that we're in right now is figuring out how to really understand the systems from a holistic place and then determine how to better manage them and have uh, and invite the right people in that are able to do so, which leads me to the question about skill set. Do you notice that these skill sets, kind of like the one you developed and, and mine as well, I kind of had a little, little foresight on it where you may not have, but the skill set that you develop now is still being applied as though you're in a greater process of discovery of your own perfected form, fit, and function in the world. Does that resonate? Yes, it does. Um, I, I can say 
that I have not experienced the work I'm doing on an as large, enlarged basis. And so prior to this, it was important work. You know, you were working on behalf of people that had been injured. So as a nurse, you're, I mean, in all of those callings before, the work was important and it was being done on behalf of bettering someone's situation. And the expectation was that the more you worked with, say, litigators who are working on behalf of plaintiffs, you get your word out there, the more they're shifting, okay, maybe the practice of law will shift a little bit too. Mm -hmm. But what's different now, and this is where the enlarged part comes from, and I hadn't thought about it, again, until you asked a question, which is <laughs> so many things to think about when I leave. Um, when I um, established Quarter Moon Story Arts, so that is my um, story-based uh, consulting business around communication and story, mm -hmm. the purpose really was to bring, as we've talked about, relationship, engagement, shifts in attitudes, behavior, culture, that's large. I mean, that's, that is really large. And I deliberately set out to do that. And so why quarter moon? Because quarter moon's better than none when you're walking a dark road. And why story arts? Because it allows us to talk about story in many different forms. Companion to that, is the podcast stories from women who walk with the the daily 60 seconds episodes but that was also deliberate what did i want to do i wanted to peddle hope and imagination in the world from the episodes that i was creating that were reflective of the discovery work i was doing for myself so um at every turn, if I ask a question, if I put out a story prompt, these are Diane Wisga kitchen tested things. You know? <laughs> I'm doing this because I'm, I'm wanting to know about myself on a larger scale and anticipating that the globe of listeners that's there is doing the same thing. I so, so love how you put that. I, and Not to interrupt, but I, I just got to yeah. say that that is so wonderful that because from two perspectives the outer is that others are having the opportunity to grow and the inner is that you're recognizing that as you are sharing you're also teaching yourself kind of what you need to know and you're learning that process as well because you're stepping into this unknown and yeah. just flowing with it because you've got the skill set to do so to begin with and as you move further that anchoring of the energy of the momentum of the ability to enlarge yourself and permeate the thoughtmosphere at a greater degree happens whether people can hear your words or engage with you or not the simple fact that those that's rippling it is and it's felt because there's a sensation to it because it resonates and as that resonation grows, when others reach that place where they're, you know, it's like you mentioned, you didn't thought, think about that because a question never been asked. Well, when they start asking questions, then that next level of access to information is there for them because it's been distilled or unpacked enough to where they can access it and, and it's available. Right? That's exactly that's exactly it, Zen. Exactly it. And because I'm older than 51. I feel like I'm in a good position to have my own counsel at this point. Absolutely. You're, you're exactly right. That um, you, I think it was C.S. Lewis who said, and I like this, he goes, what? You too? I thought I was the only one. And, and that is what I hope someone, I, I, th I hope that's a way in which someone responds when they hear something that I put out there. Oh, I'm not the only one. Oh, right. You too. Oh, okay. Well, there's a way out. You know, there's a and, way and out. That's, of this. I think, what what is possible in humanity 
once we begin to really unpack this inner experience and talk about it more openly without the fear of being rejected from others, because it does seem so weird initially, yes. right? It's like, oh, you did that too? You know, and you think about when you're sharing and how often have you had this experience where you're sharing something and that that's exactly what happens. Oh, you too? Oh, cool. And, you know, then you just have this huge unpacking in a three-hour conversation of, you know, just meeting somebody for the first time. <laughs> exactly. It, it, you, we are um, recognize, recognizing the vibration, the vibration of the beings that are there. And that, to me, is what is encouraging, hopeful, and will keep us going forward. Right. I, I, I you know, I, it, despite everything, despite everything, there is that element, um, I feel, that keeps me doing the difficult work. And the difficult work is getting out of bed in the morning. You know, that's a difficult <laughs> work. Get out of bed in the morning, ask the world, what does it need, and find a way to help the world get that. Yeah. Yeah. That's what excites me. And, 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 you know, I, my morning time, I, I can't wait to become active because that's, that's my passion uh, is to be able to, you know, share things and share people like you and talk about these kinds of things and, and raise the bar, Yes, you know, uh, pun intended. And <laughs> for, uh, for being able to, have this greater conversation available for more and the ability to feel okay with bringing it up even though it feels extremely scary and vulnerable in in the beginning for most people because well, they, they're not used to this and and especially when you've got the family dynamics of the disavowment of you know the the inner world, which is what's usually happened. A lot of kids still have this. And, and as we get older as parents, we tend to kind of minimize those experiences. And, and that's just a disservice because they're still connected far better than we are at that point because we've acquiesced to uh, the duties and responsibilities the world puts on us. And we think that that's all that there is. And it's more than that. Now, how do you, how, how would you, for somebody who's, you know, having this consternation of, you know, they've got this pressing thing going on inside of them, and how would you encourage them to develop their story? Um, I would say, start telling it to yourself. Start writing it out start saying it out loud. If you're out in the woods, talk to a tree. If you have a pet, tell it to your pet. And by doing that, by starting with yourself first, you are making it real. So it, it's being spoken. Now it's been let loose. Okay. Get comfortable with that. Get Draw images, draw storyboards, as you were talking about. It's like pulling um, your finger out of the dam. Exactly. Just start in a way that feels comfortable to you, whether it is writing words down, whether it is writing pictures down, but get the story out in a place and then speak it. Speak it to anything that will give you the sense that the story is being held as you're speaking it. And then once you have established some confidence with that, take the next courageous step of sharing it with someone who you love and trust. And you do it in a way that doesn't ask for advice. When we were very first new, new, new storytellers, you bring a story to the group and it's like bringing a newborn baby out. And mm -hmm. you don't start going, oh, that kid's got weird hair, weird eyes, <laughs> fingers are too long, its toes are too short. Blah, 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 blah. No, yeah. you just go, wow, 
that's a baby. And so when you are ready to trust someone with your story, give them the benefit of what you want them to do, which is just hold the story for me while I tell it to you. Don't ask me questions about it. Don't interrupt. Just sit on your tongue and hold the story as if I'm showing you a baby. Mm -hmm. Now, that also uh, wonderful advice. I, that, that was spectacular. And from and with me early on, when I went through my early spiritual awakening and the ears and the eyes just weren't available to really hear me from where I was speaking, and I got into uh, some time in, in uh, an institution because of it, and coming out of it in resharing, when I would be asked questions about my experience and, and so I was in a completely different place and, and I would tremble on the inside because I was afraid of being rejected and ended up back in the hospital and so there's don't be surprised if the, there's a, a slight feeling of uncomfortability that might come up in those first few sharings who just realize there's nobody there with a gun the, the, you know you're safe in that place and the only constraints that you're going to put are self-imposed I think that is very valuable advice, Zen, because the element of safety is, is critical. Mm -hmm. And so to share your story with yourself first is a place where you can establish safety with yourself. And then the next place of whom you're going to share it with, with parameters, is important as well. Um, I think that my train of thought, <laughs> oh, I know my train of thought just, um, <laughs> derailed and then it came back again. Yeah, we're tangentialists, aren't we? There you go. When, when you are ready and, and you're doing this and, and asking yourself too, for what reason, for what reason do I want to speak this story? Uh, what is it that I want to share? What story about me wants to be told? Um, somewhere, uh, I think it's probably my LinkedIn profile, I do say that I'm an incest survivor. And I, over time, would tell that story. And then it finally got to a place where I could speak in front of other incest survivors. But before that happened, I had to be really clear. I had to do my own work on my story. So well, sure. And, and the more you tell the story, the less emotionally attached you become to it. There you go. There you go. So the idea of having courage to speak your story to yourself and then having the courage to find the safe space to speak it to another. Um, there will then be the permission. Because each time you do that, you un unwittingly, perhaps unbeknownst to yourself, are then inviting the next person to say what? You too? I thought I was the only one. Yeah. Exactly. And that's not really such an otherworldly possibility either. No. You know, no. the, and I don't often use this, but, you know, now seems an appropriate time to bring in the background and the view of Earth from the moon. It, it gives us that opportunity to distance ourselves from that emotional quagmire that often is the experience right and, and so we're able to see it from a different place and we're never given challenges that we can't meet and or transcend learn from and then have the compassion for others going through the same thing it may not be identical yeah we can still recognize the patterns and know that, okay, there's help. Oh, you too, right? And, and here's what I did that might help. Or, you know, th those kinds of things where we're joining yes. hands and we're embracing each other and we're seeing each other as another you yes. or another me and recognizing from that place to bring us all up. And so that rising tide, you know, kind of uh, quells that tumultuous, tsunami on the ocean of emotion and allows us to find safe harbor in our yes. relationships 
Yes. Yes. We're looking for that, that similar vibration as um, one of my friends calls it uh, twin flames. You're looking for the twin flames that are burning there. Yeah. I, I, I found mine a few years ago. It was a cosmic conspiracy like you would not imagine all the synchronicities that, that things that lined up from both our perspectives yeah. put us in a place and she walks in front of me, my heart literally flips in my chest. No eye contact, Aww. no anything. She just walks in front of me. And um, immediately after we, did, well, not immediately, but soon thereafter, we recognized this whole concept of, of Twin Flames being a reality for us. Aww. And it's just been amazing how that deepens. And the fact that she's from Russia and I'm here, you know, there's our, our supposed enemies, right? Well, there's, they're not there's this deepening of understanding a multicultural relationship as well and, and understanding how we can grow together and, and how some words may be understood differently between us. And, and yet we yeah. have the ability of recognizing and saying, Hey, you know, we're really in this place of faith, love and trust, and, and we don't intend to trigger each other. Although, in most relationships it's unavoidable at times yeah. because you come to the table with different dictionaries yeah and a different thesaurus probably too <laughs> right right i had a great mentor also a, a lawyer his name is jerome landau and uh he's a black belt in aikido and was president of the american association for alternate dispute Re resolution okay. for a time but he says to me that that you know there really is no conflict it's just miscommunication People come to the table with two different dictionaries. They're yeah. listening from their dictionary instead of understanding the other person's. Yep. And once that takes place and you begin to understand each other, and which is a slower process, you know, we're, we're pushing for results. Well, we can't do that. You got to slow down, speed up. That, that's the, one of the current phrases being, you know, bandied about. And, and that's true. And yet, that slowing down gives us the opportunity to really dig deep and understand the other person without projecting our own belief system upon them. Yes. Yes. Realizing that you will get your chance to speak. Maybe this isn't that. Maybe this time of the slowing down is being the doula for somebody else's story. You'll get a chance to talk. And that's been a huge that's a huge learning for me. You know, you want to jump right in there and get it going. No. Well, yeah, the talking stick works well in those situations, yes. right? <laughs> yes, or the two by four cosmic thing. Of <laughs> yeah, if you're not aware of the, the talking stick and you have the patience. You know, James Redfield in the Celestine Prophecy, the third insight, I think, is just uh -huh. be patient uh -huh. enough. Wait until you emote and you feel that you need to speak, not that you want to from your head, that it comes from your being. And so we're often unable, because it's uncomfortable, right? We think we're uncomfortable with silence. Um, I was just thinking of a friend of mine who's a Quaker, and uh, that's exactly how they have their, their meetings. They just sit in silence, and, and when someone feels there is something to say, then they stand and say it. Otherwise, they don't. Mm -hmm. And the idea of going to church, as it were, and sitting in silence is like, whoa. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I need to have somebody be telling me something that I'm supposed to be doing or being. Yeah. Right? And no, yeah. that's that comes to a personal choice. And, and that's really where it all boils down to is the personal choices we make as to where to put our attention, intention, and interaction toward. Yeah. I hear piano music. Yes, my, uh, my beloved is also a conservatory trained pianist, mm. and she has uh, 30 students right now. Oh so my. We have a piano studio in our uh, uh, bottom floor, and, it's and so it sometimes fades through a little bit. It's, um, pretty. I, it's just it's amazing to hear her work with her students and she teaches young ones mostly and the way she works with them and the stories she tells and 
you know, piano it is not just about learning how to play, it's understanding the rhythms, the composers, the thinking, the feeling, the imagination, and what goes into the pieces. And this is where she asks the students to perceive what they do with the pieces of music in, in order to fully uh, or more fully integrate with them as she's teaching them. Wow. And it's just phenomenal to listen to. I mean, I learn every time she does it. Yeah. feel like yeah. a little kid in the classroom still. <laughs> and I behave like one some too. <laughs> That's okay. Never too yeah. late to have a functional childhood. Oh, I refuse to grow up. And I don't know what I want to be as, as a result, right? Yeah. Uh, I just show up and, and um, I like you say, you know, you, you step into whatever's present in the moment for you to do. And be grateful that it's there to step into. Absolutely. Honor it, embrace it, and be it to the best of your ability. And don't get caught up on thinking that you're going to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. You will. You know, that's part of the learning process. That's, that's how those, that's how your metal is honed. <laughs> yeah. And it's a mistake. Just, I took it this way instead of taking it that way. It's a mistake. Right. Uh, instead of all the heaviness that we we put on it so yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway. you know this has been such an awesome conversation i i oh yeah i loved it and i uh, i love how there were questions you hadn't thought of yet and, and oh. it prompted you to to dig and, and come up that was just a wonderful experience and, and indicative of this process right and and how it works and how we can grow together and and have that exchange that we both learn and grow with oh it was a it was a spectacular opportunity or a sparktacular if you want <laughs> and and you're and and there are questions that you asked me that i will continue to turn over um, because not only are they great questions which is um, a sign of you being a good listener and a good asker but they were also insightful in in ways that will help me go huh i hadn't imagined it that way before and if i imagine it that way now what better use can i put myself to that will better the world in a way that in, in the small way i was thinking and mm -hmm. how does that enlarge it so this uh conversation will definitely have a ripple effect in my imagination in my thought process as I go forward. And for that, a deep thank you. My pleasure. Uh, and uh, warms my heart just to have that kind of reflection. Um, it means that I'm doing what I hope to be doing. You're doing what you were called here to do and doing it well. At least partially anyway. Thank you very much. <laughs> and, uh, All right. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's much more. I mean, we're just beginning in this unfoldment of whatever new world order is going to emerge out of the chaos we're experiencing now. Yeah. And, and it will. And it will be new because we've never been there before. It's not a facade on the old. It's actually new because it's coming from within us. And there's this natural emergence of, of natural order built into the system. We're just beginning to recognize it, right? That's it. Cool. All right. Thanks again so much, Diane. Um, and namaste and in la catch. Thank you all for watching this episode of One World in a New World. I'm Zen Benefil, your host, and I will see you next time. <laughs>